Welcome to a new Carter Report series, The Game Changers. These rare individuals appear once in a lifetime, like a blazing meteor across the night sky. They change the course of history. They show us the way forward. Welcome to The Game Changers. I just want to give you the warmest welcome today. This program is called, uh, you know what it is? The Game Changers. Yeah, this is one of the Game Changers series. History tells the story of a few good men and women who've stood out against the crowd for a good reason, for a high good. We call them the Game Changers. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, was a game changer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor who stood out against Hitler, was a game changer. He said, we are not to simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. Pretty good, eh? Uh, Winston Churchill, the great leader of Great Britain during the dark days, was a game changer. Desmond Doss, who refused to carry a gun. You might say, I don't agree with that. It doesn't fit into our society. It doesn't matter what we think about it, but he was a man of principle. He's the hero of Hacksaw Ridge, a game changer. Florence Nightingale, the British nurse who brought help and nursing to the battlefield was a game changer. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian who stood out against the communists, who was thrown into the concentration camps, was a game changer. Uh, these people are a rare breed. They've escaped the herd mentality that was so eloquently described by Nietzsche, the game changers. I would like to be, God helping me, a game changer. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Today we're going to talk about one of the most extraordinary but least known characters in history, Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite. Take your Bible, please, and turn to James chapter 5 and verse 17. James chapter 5 and verse 17, but I'm going to take it today from the NIV. It says, Elijah was a man. He was a man. Just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. The Bible says he was not an extraordinary man. He was an ordinary man who did uh, extraordinary things. Uh, the name Elijah means my God is Yahweh the Lord. It took a lot of courage to say that you stood for God. There are some reasons why we include Elijah in our top game changes. He's mentioned by Christ in the New Testament. He raised a dead person to life. Extraordinary. He stood for Yahweh the Lord when Baal worship had taken over Israel, it was like a Christian today living in the land of Isis. He called down fire from God out of heaven. He predicted the deaths of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And uh, it came to pass. He escaped death. That makes him a game changer. He was caught up by a fiery chariot, travelled through space, never died. Now, 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1, he is introduced to history. Now, this, of course, is in the Old Testament. And we will stay for a bit today in the book of Kings. And I'm going to read from the Bible a great deal today. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Then Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel stands before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain 
these years except at my word. He appears out of nowhere. Uh, Moses doesn't appear out of nowhere. But Elijah appears out of nowhere. He's called uh, the Tishbite. We're not even quite sure where that town is, the town of Tishbe, but he comes from the land of Gilead. And you'll notice it's uh, east of the Jordan. He doesn't come from Jerusalem or Samaria, but Gilead, uh, the hill country. It was a land of forests and a land of of little streams, uh, Uh, This man, Elijah, was what we would call a mountain man. (laughs) Uh, Apparently with God, stuff doesn't make us strong, virtuous, intelligent or wise. We are into the stuff society where a golden Rolex or something like this, this is terribly important. God often sends his man or woman into the wilderness, Moses, For 40 years, Jesus into the wilderness. John the Baptist came from the desert. Luther came from a Roman Catholic cloister. Because apparently stuff doesn't matter terribly. Elijah was a man from the wild mountains and the lonely desert. He was not from the seminary or the theological cemetery. I was attending a little while ago a meeting in my homeland of Australia. Uh, I was at a college. A professor said, when I was called to work at the cemetery, oops, he said, uh, I mean seminary. (laughs) Maybe he should not have corrected himself. Maybe he was right. Elijah came from the desert where the sky was his ceiling, the earth was his table, and God was his teacher. His mind was not polluted with garbage like ours. So often he had a direct link to the creator of the universe. He was never ordained by man and he never worked for a church organization. So what do you say about that, eh? Boy, fancy that. He's, in fact, we would not have given him a job today in any church. Look at 1 Kings 17 verse 1 again. And Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Who was Ahab? Ahab was the corrupt king of Israel married to the Philoptus, the beautiful Jezebel, high priestess of Baal. And he goes in before the king of Israel, this man, and he says, God has had enough of you and your filth. No rain except at my word until I say so. How old was Elijah? There's no evidence to say that he was an old man, as all the pictures say. You see a picture of Elijah, he's an old fogey. John the Baptist was like Elijah and Elijah was around 30 years of age as was our Lord. God can use old men with white hair but he can doubly use young men. Don't forget it. God is looking for men who are strong whom he can use. Now look at 1 Kings 17, 2 and 3. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan. Uh, We're not quite sure where it was. It's hard to identify, just a little trickle. So God sends him to the brook Kareth to get out of harm's way for the time being. And if you look at verses 4 and 5, 4 and 5, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed there, to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Kareth, which flows into the Jordan. Um, This is quite an extraordinary thing because God says, I'm going to take care of you in an extraordinary way. 
And if you notice, I think it is, I think verse 6 and 7. 6 and 7. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And uh, then the brook dried up because there had been no rain. Uh, God says to this man, even though, uh, even though there is a famine, there's no water, everything's dying, I will take care of you. God says, in the time of trouble, I will take care of you. You see, even if the economy collapses, which it will do, it cannot in America continue on this suicide rate of uncontrolled deficits, you see. But even if the economy collapses, God says, I will take care of you. There are two philosophies. Number one, naturalism, and number two, supernaturalism. Now, you're going to believe one of the two. Naturalism says that nature is God. Everything that happens, even the emergence of the human species, is simply by nature. Nature becomes the God. And the other philosophy says there is a self-existent creator who controls nature. And everything is in the hands of Almighty God. You see, Elijah believed in God. I believe in God. Now look at 1 Kings 17, verse 8 and 9, I think. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, up on the Mediterranean coast, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he gets up and he walks over the dust and the dirt and the dead vegetation and he comes to the Mediterranean coast and uh, he comes to this little town. And here comes a woman and she's in great distress. She has a son. And he says to her, <laughs> and this seems absurd, he says, uh, can you give me something to eat, please? <laughs> I'm really hungry. I could have a good meal now. And she says, I'm just getting some sticks and I'm going to anoint the sticks. I've got a little bit of flour and I've got a few drops of oil. And we're going to eat this and we're going to die. <laughs> but she didn't realise that because there is a God in heaven that her night was passing and the sun was going to rise upon her. Something, so when things look the worst, it is because God is preparing us, you know, for the best. Don't forget this, you see. The worst moment, but God had a great blessing, unexpected. Never, 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 never. Churchill said, give up because your sun is about to rise and shine. Don't listen to the pessimists. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the defeatists. For the child of God, the best is still to come. You see? Now look at chapter 17, 13 and 14. And Elijah said to her, do not fear Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, put this down in the molecules of your mind. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain On the earth, God says, there'll always be enough. (laughs) You'll never run out. Always enough oil. (laughs) Always enough meal. It doesn't matter how bad things get. It doesn't matter how much you use it. There'll always be enough left over. You see? 
This is the difference between naturalism and supernaturalism. Always enough oil and flour. There's a text in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4, it says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. If you believe in the God of Elijah, then you'll never come to the place where there is not enough. You see? Uh, I can remember (laughs) years ago when we were on the Broadway in Glendale in Southern California. We came to the place. This happened quite a few few times. Uh, We didn't have enough money to make payroll. What are we going to do? We believe God has called us. We don't have enough money to, to pay our bills. But let me tell you folks something. <laughs> God said to us, just hold on and keep trusting. That's what I say to you. Because on every occasion when it appeared to us that the barrel had no food left in it, no grain left in it, <laughs> and the little pot had no oil left in it, God was ready to do something great for us. And so there are two types of people in this world, people who are naturalists and who don't have faith, and there are people who believe in a supernatural God. Now look at verses 15 and 16, 1 Kings 17. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. Now, this is a great, great text. Get it down into your mind. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. God will take care of you. There will always, always be enough. And then when things were looking bright and cheery, as often happens, when things seem to be going so good, all of a sudden uh, the bottom fell out. And you can read the story in verses 17 and 18. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. He died. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? So this is a terrible tragedy. I've got enough food. The widow's got nobody else in the world. And she's got a boy. What's the good of feeding a boy if he dies? And the boy dies. Verses 18 and 19. And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Verse 20. And he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And verse 21 and 22. And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Let it come back into him. And then if you look at verse 22, then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. Um, almost too hard to believe, isn't it? Hmm. He was a boy, he's dead. But you've got to think, do we believe in supernaturalism or just naturalism? If we go just by naturalism, the boy's dead and he's finished and so are you. So when we die like Richard Dawkins, somebody said, what are you going to do, Dr. Dawkins, the most famous atheist in the world? Um, What are you going to do, Dr. Dawkins, when you die? He said, I'm going to stand on the deck of the ship and salute. What's the good of saluting when you're going down to nothingness? 
But here is a boy who dies. And the Bible tells us that the supernatural God who is over all things, over nature, <laughs> brings the boy back again. Uh, ex extraordinary. We see the promise of resurrection every spring. I've been in Siberia in winter when it is so extraordinarily cold. A white freezing wilderness, spring comes and that which was dead comes to life again. God has given us images in nature so that you and I will not be in despair, but we believe in the God who raises the dead. This is the teaching of the Bible. And verse 23, 24. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in you, in your mouth, is the truth. So here today, as we talk about the game changers, we're talking about a man who was in touch with the almighty God of the universe. And when you are in touch with the almighty God of the universe, nothing is too hard for you. Believe it. Believe it. Step out of the darkness. Step into the light. Now. Now. The great confrontation. Look at 1 Kings 18, verse 7 and 8. 1 Kings 7, 18, 7 and 8. Now as Obadiah, servant of God, was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him after three years. He recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my Lord, Elijah? And he answered, It is I. Go tell your master. Tell Ahab, Elijah is here. Ahab wants to kill him. And Elijah goes to Obadiah, who is a man of God who works for the king. He says, Go and tell the king. Elijah is here. Now this Obadiah had been hiding the servants of God from the wrath of the king and his wife. Look at verse, 1 Kings 18, verse 13. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? Jezebel was murdering the prophets of God. How I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water. Um, here's a man, and uh, he's living in a time of the greatest apostasy in the church. I want you to notice now, this is most important that you see this because we're going to call, we're going to bring about a parallel between those days and the days in which we live now in America. I want to talk now about the times and the prevailing sentiment. Before the great confrontation, I want us to have a look at Ahab and uh, Jezebel and Baal. Ahab was the king of Israel and the leader of uh, the church. It was around 60 years since Solomon, son of David, and each successive king had been worse than his predecessor. Ahab uh, was a weak man uh, ruled by a strong woman. He was not the first and he will not be the last. Look at 1 Kings uh, chapter 16 and verse 30 and 31. 1 Kings 16, 30 and 31. Now Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So the king of Israel marries the high priestess 
of the god Baal. And I wonder what they did. Would you please notice verse 32 and 33. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab uh, made a wooden image. Ahab did more to revoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Um, (laughs) In the second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the degrading practices of Baal worship. Perverted sex, violence, and the murder of babies. And we're going to ask the question, uh, is there need today for Elijah? More in a moment. The reviews for the John Carter biography are in, and this is what they say. Anyone who reads this fascinating book and is not moved should check to see if they still have a pulse. I believe this book about God's miracles in Russia and Ukraine will burn the flame in your heart. This could prove to be one of the most important books ever written about public evangelism. Make sure you get a copy. I believe this book about John Carter's life will help readers grasp a vision for their lives. For a donation of $100 or more, a signed copy of the John Carter biography can be yours by writing to us at the address on the screen or visit our website. has got a time and a place for everything. Nothing happens by chance. In spite of the powers of darkness, nothing can destroy the church of God. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the gospel is not about you and me. It is the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. What and where is heaven? This DVD series from John Carter will be yours with a gift of $50 US or $70 Australian. Write to us at the address on the screen. Shipping is free in the US and Australia. Visit carterreport.org, your home for inspirational teaching. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.